Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Katie Mary and today it is finally Finally, the part two of my certification guide. There is going to be at least one video more on this topic simply to cover a lot of ground. But a while ago, I started this series. I don't know if you can call it a series if there is only one entry at this point. Now there are two. I started a series to sort of break down what the different labels and certifications stood for, what they mean, what they seek to do, if they're doing it and generally just to create a little bit of overview for people who really want to make the best choices but don't always know what the labels and certifications mean. I will also be going over whether or not these organizations actually reach the goals that they're setting, how they're doing it, if they're efficient, if it's something that can be trusted or if it isn't. We're going to go through all of it and in this video we're going to be looking at specifically cotton and some sustainable forestry. In the last video we talked about different kinds of business models, we talked about 1% for the planet and B Corp, we also talked a little bit about animal ag and fishing labels, all this kind of stuff. So go and check that other video out if you want to know more and you can also find the comprehensive list with all the information about all the certificates in the blog post on my blog. The link is down below. Let's get started. The first label that I want us to be looking at is RSPO. The RSPO was founded in 2004. It stands for the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil and it was a certification system that was included in the industry in order to push for more sustainable policies, which the palm oil industry desperately needs, seriously. I've already made an entire impact video about palm oil, which you can also find down below, where we're also talking a little bit more about RSPO because there's a lot to say. Okay. The RSPO has also been called the best in class among standards by the WWF, which was one of the leading forces in founding the organization. So that's a little weird. And I guess at one point I really need to do a video about the worldwide fund. But at this point, it's pretty established that the palm oil industry is in fact really, really harmful, really dangerous and really polluting. So this was a certification system that was introduced in order to push for things to be more sustainable and generally better. However, the policies of the RSPO has been criticized by several scientists and news platforms because of the lack of assurance of the results of their policies, for deliberately formulating vague and imprecise criteria, for being corrupted by industrial interests rather than the ecological, and for protecting the corporations who fail to meet their sustainability goals like Johnson & Johnson and Kraft Heinz, who supposedly are RSPO members but simply just refuse to show any sort of supply chain transparency or results of their certification process. It also took the RSPO 14 years to ban forest destruction. It finally happened in November 2018 but it's still really not being enforced as a rule. In the Greenpeace report, Dying for Cookie, you can read tons more about some of the effects of forest destruction because of palm oil. I've also left that down below. In 2019, roughly three quarters of the fires linked to palm oil companies were on RSPO members' land. This means that so-called sustainable palm oil growers are in some cases at the forefront of Indonesia's environmental crisis. Also, another report from 2019, from the Environmental Investigation Agency and the Malaysian Grassroots Organization show that RSPO members are effectively giving false environmental credibility to their products and brands. The report uncovers fraudulent auditing of palm oil plantations, primarily forest cleared, to make way for more plantations and community rights being violated. In terms of labeling, I have very little trust in the RSPO at this moment. I know that it's definitely still the best among class because there's not really any other certification systems out there for palm oil but it sets a really low bar. It doesn't mean that all their products are falsely labeled it just means that it happens enough for me to not feel guaranteed whenever I buy something that is labeled with RSPO. Now it should be mentioned that producing palm oil actually requires fewer resources than other types of oil. For instance the impact would be way bigger if we started producing olive oil to replace the palm oil we're using. The issue lies in the massive overconsumption of it and it's used in countless food products and to make biofuel. A step towards solving these problems is to ban certain products from using palm oil and also ban them from replacing it with other types of oil. AKA manufacturers have to alter their recipes completely to function without these products. So we can avoid it being overused. And certification is a really good step in that direction, but unfortunately this industry has a very low bar for what sustainability means. Now let's talk about Rainforest Alliance. 
In 2018, Rainforest Alliance and Universal Trade Zone merged under the same banner, Rainforest Alliance. And the Rainforest Alliance certified seal means that some or all of the ingredients of a product is sourced from farms that comply with the standards of the Sustainable Agriculture Network, which aims to promote sustainability in farming and protect farmers, forests, wildlife, and local communities. And the seal is verified through on-farm inspections. There are several costs relating to getting this seal, there usually are, and that ranges from the cost of the on-site inspections. And then there's also this royalty system where you pay a certain amount per unit of product. The green label frog can be found on coffee, tea, herbs, chocolate, nuts, oil, fruit, etc. And a rainforest certified farm is one that complies with the 10 standards set by the Sustainable Agriculture Network. As of 2019, 80% of the RA labeled products contained 90 to 100% certified ingredients. Furthermore, Rainforest Alliance started introducing stricter requirements in 2020. The Rainforest Alliance has lower requirements for certified palm oil, where a product must only contain 30% to be certified with the label. According to the Rainforest Alignment website, this is due to the low number, or like the limited number of farms that make palm oil in general. That number is much lower than the number of farms that make coffee, tea, chocolate, etc. One would, however, argue that palm oil farms tend to be much bigger. But that's neither here nor there. And herbal teas have to contain about 40% certified product in order to carry the label. In terms of policies not being followed, because that's usually something that happens with any kind of certificate, some people end up not following it, some farm farming and practices end up going against the restrictions or the guidelines of the label. And when that happens, the new policies set by the Rainforest Alignment prohibit people from decertifying farms that don't follow the rules which is a big problem for consumer transparency. There's also no time frame for farms to reach the guidelines of the Rainforest Alignment whilst carrying their label, and there's very little data to show individual farming practices and improvements. The Rainforest Alignment has actually also included workers' rights in their standards, but there's something that they're clearly missing here because they have not taken action to protect farmers and workers from price volatility, like Fairtrade does. The new organization has also watered down many of the previous requirements, including those on overtime, payment in kind, maternity leave, and preference for organic fertilizers. In conclusion, this label and this certification process used to be a lot more strict in the past, but over time it has come to get a lot bigger customers and clients, and thus seem to be watering down some of their guidelines. This has also happened to other certification brands and labels before and it's generally a huge problem within this industry. Now let's talk about the FSC. The Forest Stewardship Council was founded in 1993 as the 1992 Rio F Summit failed to reach a global sustainability forest agreement to reduce deforestation. The Forest Stewardship Council promotes and encourages sustainable forestry practices and their label indicates that the wood derived materials in a product came from a sustainably managed forest that also takes into account biodiversity and protects local communities. There are three different FSC labels. There is 100% of materials in a product sourced by the FSC certified forest management practices. Then there are mixed products containing FSC certified wood and recycled materials and recycled products containing both post and pre-consumer content. Post-consumer recycling waste is of course what we really want here. When becoming FSC certified, a company submits an application and chooses a third party certification body like a third-party auditor to assess the production practices of that company. When founding the FSC, several social and environmental groups teamed up with several companies from that industry to encourage this more sustainable forestry practice. The wish was to create a voluntary system that also benefits the people with the label to sort of nudge the rest of the industry into getting their shit together. Basically. Sadly, some reports show that the FSC certification has been less than successful in their goal to reduce specifically tropical deforestation. There are also several scandals that show how FSC timber has been linked into the trafficking of illegal materials. In 2014, it was reported that FSC certified loggers in Russia harvested timber from areas that were under legal protection. In 2015, a Chinese company marketed to the US offered to put a certification label on illegal wood in exchange for a 10% markup. 
The same year, a report showed that an FSC-certified Austrian company locked illegal wood in the national parks of Romania. In 2016, in Peru, reports showed that 90% of the timber on two shipments from the Amazon headed to the US and Mexico was of illegal origin. And the company still includes on their website that they comply with FSC criteria, even though their certification was suspended in 2017. Many of these reports have been conducted by the Environmental Investigation Agency, and they were actually not meant to target FSC certified timber. FSC just kept popping up in these scandals. So, furthermore, one of the original goals of the FSC was to protect tropical rainforests. However, today, very, very few tropical loggers are actually certified. The majority of FSC certified loggers are located in the Northern America or in Europe. One reason might be that over time, the FSC certification fees have gone up exponentially and now Southern American loggers can afford to be included. As such, the FSC is rewarding companies that already have a lower carbon footprint or already work in areas that are more sustainable simply because because of where they geologically are located. But that wasn't the point of the program to begin with. Many of the companies that are FSC certified, both in the Northern America and in Europe, are by default more sustainable because they operate in areas where there are more environmental policies in place. The carbon footprint of these companies are also generally lower because they are not harvesting from tropical areas and they are not shipping their products as far. As such, they end up rewarding companies that have it easier to begin with rather than helping those that really, really need it, which is a huge problem. Alan Blackman, an economist from Resources of the Future and lead author of the 2015 study on FSC certification in Mexico, argues that the FSC may have had very little effect on deforestation for that simple reason that a lot of the deforestation in developing countries is not happening associated with the forestry operations. Instead, the driving factor of deforestation is illegal land use change meaning conversion from natural forest to palm oil plantations, commercial agriculture and ranching. Who would have thought that I could bring in animal agriculture in this when we're talking about forests? <gasps> Shocker. With the FSC, there's so much work to be done. And honestly, it seems like they really need to change their entire business practices from the bottom and up. Of course, this means that there are still good things that they are doing. But once again, these scandals and these overall faulty business practices just seem to overshadow the good sometimes. There are also cases where the FSC standard is higher than competitors. But again, this is not necessarily guaranteed. Now we're getting to the cotton part of the video where we'll first be talking about Ecotex. Ecotex is an umbrella term that covers generally three different kinds of certifications. We have the standard 100, then we have leather and then made green. The most well known is probably the standard 100. This tests for harmful substances in the garments and ensures that the garment approved by the standard do not pose a threat to human health. The leather certificate has a similar goal but because leather tanning is so different from working with uh, cotton and generally other types of fabrics, those two are separated. And then there's the made in green, which goes far beyond both the standard 100 and the leather label and seeks to ensure sustainable and socially responsible production practices as well. The most important thing to know about the standard 100, which is what I will be talking about from now on, is that it is not a certificate that shows anything about sustainability and it's not a certificate that shows anything about workers' rights. This is incredibly important to remember because many companies use it as such. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen companies advertise their standard 100 certification as a way of saying that they are now sustainable. It means that the product is safe to wear and that there are no chemicals left in the products when you put them on, but it does not ensure whatever could happen within the supply chain and chemicals might still very well be used earlier in the supply chain. And again, it does not ensure that people are paid properly for their work and it doesn't ensure sustainable farming or business practices in general. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Then there is the GOTS which stands for Global Organic Textile Standard. The GOTS was developed in 26 by four major organizations. The Environmental Association of Natural Textile Industry, Japan Cotton Organic Association, the Organic Trade Association and the Soil Association. And the certificate is available on two levels. One level ensures that a product contains more than 95% organic material. The other level ensures between 70 to 94% organic materials. And in this case, the exact percentage has to be disclosed on the GOTS label. The GOTS level certifies the entire supply chain and the entire process of making garments processes, spinners, weavers, dyers, and all other aspects of the production. 
as part of the labeling requirement in addition to the GOTS logo the license number or name of the certified supplier database must be included so consumers can look up the information of the item they have purchased. Now let's talk about Better Cotton. BCI or Better Cotton Initiative was founded in the beginning of the 2000s by WWF and a series of commercial brands in order to optimize cotton production. Among the founders were Adidas, IKEA, H&M and Gap. The BOTS is not actually a certification body but instead it provides training and guidelines. When buying a product that is certified or labeled with the BSI logo it doesn't mean that anything has actually happened. This is very important as a consumer to remember because many brands who use this label seem to conveniently forget it. It's more of a digital pamphlet organization than a certification body. BCI provides training and guidance related to pesticide use, water, wastewater management, soil health, biodiversity, as well as wages and working conditions. But you are, as I said, nowhere near guaranteed a sustainable product when you buy something with a BSI label. It might be a really good step in the right direction, some would say, but I also definitely see the detrimental effects of letting labels that serve as guidance work as certification bodies, or that it's possible or allowed to to advertise those as certification bodies when it isn't. And with that being said, that was the second part of my certification guide. I hope that you liked it. I hope that this was helpful. Girl was a little bit more cynical in this video than the last video, but alas, that's why we're here. Okay, cool. If you have any other certifications that you are curious about that you want me to include in the next video, leave them down below. And as always, have an amazing day. Take really good care of yourselves. Until next time, bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!